Hi there, and welcome to the first of a 33-part series showing you step-by-step -step how to create a working prototype of Traffic Department 2192. We'll spend the first two hours studying the original game files with a hex editor and disassembler. We'll build several utilities in C that convert the custom graphics assets to bitmaps with the help of SDO. We'll also study non-graphics assets using Python scripts to understand how we can use them in our prototype. The next two hours of our journey focus on design. We'll build a casual design document in PowerPoint that will be our guide during programming. Our final three hours has us working in GameMaker Studio, a commercial game engine specializing in 2D applications and is available free from YoYo -Yo Games. You will see every line of code that goes into the final product. I make a conscious effort to solve similar problems in different ways, and much of the code you see is first pass. We don't spend time refactoring or building clever abstractions, even though there's plenty of opportunity for it. I always try to explain the code in at least a conceptual or pseudocode level as I type. And my typing is sped up at least double time in order to minimize dead space. You will see mistakes. I'm human and I make plenty of them. We'll see compiler errors, crashes, and many other weird things. I'll prove many times over that cutting and pasting a code block will create bugs. But bugs are a learning opportunity and I don't shy away from dealing with them. This project is targeted at late beginners or early intermediates. You should have some experience with projects on the order of a thousand lines of code or more. I'll throw out terms like priority queue, hoping that you instinctively understand the situations where those are useful. You don't have to know how to implement anything in particular without references, though. This isn't a job interview or a university exam. My personal goal here is to create a tutorial for a true mid-sized programming project that's doable in a reasonable amount of time. And finally, Please learn something and pass on what you know. All right, welcome to our first look at the 1993 classic Traffic Department 2192 by P Squared Productions. We'll jump right in by running through a single level of gameplay using our developer's eye to dissect the experience. We'll identify core elements of the game, including assets, mechanics, and game flow, in order to build intuition for our upcoming work in asset extraction and prototyping. We'll finish by creating a high-level diagram that will evolve over the course of this series. So sit back, put on our thinking caps, and let's play Traffic Department. Welcome back. In this video, we'll map out our approach to solving the asset problem. That is, getting our hands on the sprites, backgrounds, music, sounds, maps, and any other components we need to construct our prototype. We'll explore the file structure of Traffic Department and consider an approach to extracting assets. Finally, I'll show you the tools that we'll use during this process. This time we'll take our first steps towards making Traffic Department. We'll transform the original game SCR files into bitmap graphics by making a small C program using an SDL data structure. Before we do that, we'll dive into a few SCR files to understand how the data is stored and discover the transformation steps. After we've converted the 44 SCR files, I'll do a quick code review to point out several important problems with the C program, despite its success. Now that we've extracted single graphics assets from a file, we'll take the next step by opening a packed file to build a sprite strip. The target will be the character faces we see during each briefing and debriefing sequence. We'll rely on the same tools as before, a hex editor, PowerShell, and the GNU-C compiler. Now we won't have to build a program from scratch or discuss new theory, so this video should be short. We're now ready to extract the third and final basic type of graphics file from the Traffic Department Archive, the BLK files. We'll rely on the same workflow and tool set from the last two segments, but I'll introduce the idea of a default palette. This short video will feel like a review before we change up our approach for the next group of assets. This time, we'll tackle a graphics archive that takes more than a hex editor to understand. The PIC files prove to be more inconsistent than the SCR, FACES, or BLK files that we've already taken apart. We'll start with a hex editor, but we'll soon see that the rules for one file don't apply to the other files. We need to use a disassembler to show us how the game itself handles these files. I'll give a quick primer on disassembly with IDA Pro before we jump into the application binary to find the information we need to build our extraction utility. We've learned four different ways that Traffic Department stores images. Now it's time to put that knowledge to use by sprinting through three archives in one sitting. The SHP, HEL, and EXP files all use the same storage method as the BLK files. The lesson this time is how to get stuff done. We're down to the last two segments involving graphics assets within the Traffic Department archive. 
This time we'll pull out the menu graphics by building a utility based on our approach to the SCR files, with some slight modifications. We'll use a hex editor to gauge the dimensions of the MEN and SSS files before programming up our solution in C. We're on the home stretch with graphics assets. This time we'll pull out the custom fonts that we see overlaid on the setting screens and in the dialog sequences. Now dealing with fonts can be complicated, but we'll defer that discussion until we actually use them in the prototype. For now, we'll stick to the formula by using a hex editor to estimate the dimensions of the character glyphs and create a C utility to transform them into bitmaps. We're now ready to look at the game data assets that don't have set standards and how they can be stored. The developers could have chosen virtually any storage method that suited the needs of the system and the application. Fortunately, we'll be able to tackle these assets with our toolset and common sense. We'll start with the game maps by understanding the contents of the files, figuring out how they work, and decide if we need to convert them to a new format or leave them as they are. We briefly looked at the dialog files during the asset overview in part 3. These files contain both the dialog text as well as the control instructions that aren't friendly with text interpreters. By the end of this video, we'll understand exactly how these files work and how we can incorporate them into the prototype. The mission script files may be the most complicated game data asset in the traffic department archive. They contain the information used to initialize missions and could potentially have many moving parts. We'll now build several Python utilities in order to understand how these files can contribute to our prototype. Sound and music are the final assets we need before we begin our prototype. This will be a simple conversion exercise using both DOSBox and Audacity export features to keep the process quick. During processing, I'll discuss how this task could be complicated if we went down the road of building a sound synthesizer on our own. Prototyping a game allows us to get to the action quickly. We'll have our hands on a fully playable version of Traffic Department in a few hours by relying on the commercial game engine, Game Maker Studio. I'll spend a few minutes discussing why we're using an engine, and then we'll do preliminary work setting up the environment for the game. This time we'll pick up the PowerPoint design document that we started after the initial playthrough. We've already logically segmented the game into parts, which will become rooms in Game Maker. We'll then design and implement three objects that control basic features used in all the rooms in the game. Now we'll revisit the introduction sequence and design an equivalent scene using the Game Maker object model. I'll show you how we can capture the scene dynamics using a simple finite state machine. We'll drive that machine with a custom markup language interpreted at runtime. Finally, we'll extract the introduction text from the binary in preparation for programming next time. It's time to build our design for the introduction sequence. We'll create two objects in GameMaker and fill out the code we specified last time. We'll also hit several supporting tasks such as adding markup language to our script file and importing our font asset as a sprite strip into GameMaker. Finally, we'll watch our scene play out as we compare it to the original game. This time we'll draw up a design that mimics the main menu of Traffic Department. We'll spend a few minutes looking at how the original game handles the menu, and then review the graphics assets that we have to work with. We'll sketch out a design that uses three Game Maker objects and a simple approach to animation that's a bit more expensive than color cycling used by the real game. We're now going to develop the main menu design from the last video. We'll implement the three objects in Game Maker and test each of them in turn. If everything works out, we'll do a side-by-side -side comparison between our version and the original game. We've been slowly building towards Traffic Department's action sequence by taking on more complicated tasks. This time we'll design the briefing scenes, which include screens, banners, pop-ups, and the dialogue sequence. We'll take a close look at the first mission and generalize a design that'll apply to every briefing scene in the game. Our solution ties together several sources of hard-coded data from the game binary that we'll work with when we program next time. We've designed a solution to mimic the traffic department briefings, and now we'll make it happen. We'll import several graphics assets, a new font, dialog data, and the mission title text which we'll extract from the original binary. Then we'll create the objects and their interactions in Game Maker. Along the way, we'll have to build code that reads and interprets both our homemade storyboard and the instructions from the dialog files. If that's not enough, we'll also construct a parser to alter and display the dialog lines. This is the most brutal programming video in this series. We finally made it to the part that most consider the game, the top-down action sequence. We'll design the gameplay across several arcs, starting with the mission map. Then we'll bring in the ships, their actions and interactions, We'll consider AI control before turning our attention to the user interface and wrap up with mission scripting.
This video will cover the entire design and will separate the programming across the next several videos. This time we'll put the game world together by getting the city map drawn on the screen just as it appears in the original game. We'll start by converting our map files from the original binary format to something closer to UTF. Then we'll draw the map to the screen starting with a slow process using only main memory. We'll close by moving the map to video RAM to boost drawing performance. We need to get the ships into the game world and interacting with the environment. Our first step is to create the player ship, get it moving around and colliding with the barriers that we established in the last video using a collision map. Then we'll add the ability to shoot our weapons. Finally, we'll add some visual effects for when a ship is destroyed. Our ship design today is the prototype for all ships that we'll be adding next time. We have the player ship in the game world and now we'll bring in computer controlled ships. We'll have to modify the mission file format in order to read it as text. Then we'll start the AI controller with a passive path following behavior. Our new headquarters object will load the player, the NPC ships, and their paths. If we have time, we'll add ship damage from weapons. This time we'll get the heads up display into the game. We'll have to solve several problems including surface overlays for the minimap and text scrolling for the ticker. This object is the most complicated and highly coupled object we'll create during prototyping. A better design would probably split this up into several child objects. I expect to go through several debug passes to get this right. We have enemy ships moving around the game world, but now we'll make them react to the player and fight back. The A-star algorithm lets opponents deviate from their path, hunt the player, and return to their mission if they disengage. Now that we can see damage effects in the HUD, we'll tweak the game balance to something the player can win. Now that the actors are in place, we'll construct the framework to support missions in Traffic Department. We'll start by extending ship loading to an initialization sequence using data scripts for setting a default mission. The player simply needs to destroy all hostile ships and return to base for debriefing. We'll organize the scripts so that they can be easily extended to cover all missions down the road. Thanks to the code scaffolding that we built last time for the default mission, we can now script mission 1 in about 20 lines. The time consuming part is discovering exactly what to put in those lines. We'll run through the code and use Ida Pro to help us with mission scripting. It's time to bring the player back to the main menu and close the loop on a single round of gameplay. We'll create a new object that displays the results of the round, including kill count and a performance rating. We'll then repurpose the briefing object to implement the debriefing sequence in just a dozen extra lines of code. Our prototype is almost feature complete compared to the original game. The player can watch the briefings, finish the missions, and save the game for later. Now we're going to enhance the game by allowing the player to zoom out and see larger areas. We'll also modify the briefing with an option to skip the mission and go straight to the debriefing sequence. These enhancements are the final step in prototyping before we have to decide to either continue with Game Maker and fill in the content, or break away and design a custom engine to support our feature set. This video brings us to the end of my plan for the prototype, but there's still a lot of work that could be done. I'll fix a serious memory leak that's been in the design for the last 8 videos, we'll add a few minor fixes before discussing some game mechanics that I left out. I'll also add more storyboards for the mission briefing so there's more content to look at when I host this on the web. Finally, I'll close with some final thoughts on this project.